sometimes perhaps too rarely a really good book comes along introducing the general public to Islam by an author who really knows what he's talking about an expert and one such book is a thinking person's guide to Islam uh, the essence of Islam in 12 verses from the Quran now, the author is rather distinguished he is his royal highness Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed uh, educated at Harrow School here in the UK he has two PhDs one from Cambridge University in the UK and the other from Al-Azhar University in Cairo in Egypt. He is a professor of Islamic philosophy and his book Love in the Holy Quran, which you can read for free online, has been widely acclaimed going through 10, 10 editions and he serves as the chief advisor for religious and cultural affairs to His Majesty King Abdullah al-Hussein of Jordan, who is his father of course. Uh, the book has received rave reviews on the back cover from the Dalai Lama, uh, from Mufti Usmani, from uh, Sheikh Mohammed al Yaqubi, from Sheikh Nur Keller, from various academics at Oxford, Yale, Georgetown, etc. I won't bore you with all the quotes, but they love it. Um, it is very readable. Uh, it's full of interesting uh, observations and insights into the Sharia, into the different uh, groupings within Islam, uh, in the Quran and everything. Uh, there's a lovely passage here on uh, the obstacles he sees in reading the Quran. I wanted to share that with you. I believe what he's saying is really quite spot on. And he says, when people, even Muslims, who have never read the Quran in their lives, start to read it with concentration, their first reaction is often one of surprise and even confusion. Some people cannot seem to make sense of it at all. This is because there are obstacles to overcome in reading the Quran. These obstacles are not difficult to overcome, but it helps to be aware of them. And he says there are three kinds of obstacles preventing people from understanding the book. These are, one, obstacles in the act of reading, two, obstacles in the reader, and three, obstacles in the Quranic text itself. So as regards one, obstacles in the act of reading, he says, The Quran is in classical Arabic, in the dialect of the tribe of Quraysh, notwithstanding a few well-known words of non-Arabic origin. It is not the same as colloquial or modern standard Arabic. Because of its linguistic richness, it cannot be translated properly. Its translations are all only interpretations. Quranic Arabic has to be learned anew, even by native Arabic speakers. Nevertheless, this is usually a question of a limited number of Arabic words. The Quran was an oral revelation set in an oral culture. Without hearing it read aloud, according to his own rules of recitation, the reader misses not only the melody of the verses, but also the power and the resonance of the words as well as their inner connections with each other. And this next point I think is really uh, insightful. Modern education leads people to expect to read simple, short texts which immediately offer up all their information and which are nothing more than they appear. Usually these also have even simpler executive summaries of their important points. But the Quran must be read slowly and in depth because the author the capital a is omniscient and so all the different linguistic possible meanings of the words are pre-intended by the author also it is full of symbols similes metaphors allegories hints leads allusions and internal references this is perhaps because certain truths cannot be fully conveyed by the surface of words alone Moreover, it's not a short text, 600 pages in most Arabic editions, and needs time and patience to even begin to contemplate it. Indeed, most devout Muslims learn it in childhood. Anywhere between 1 to 10 million Muslims know the Quran by heart and spend between 30 minutes and an hour every day of their lives reading it. The Quran is not a chronological or a linear text, the Bible is basically a historical, chronologically arranged text. It starts with the beginning, the book of Genesis, and goes right through to the end of the Hebrew prophets, notwithstanding an interlude of timeless wisdoms, wisdom books such as the Psalms. 
Then the New Testament tells the story of Jesus, peace be upon him, then his disciples, and he ends with the book of Revelation, looking forward, as it were. <clears throat> but the Quran is not arranged in the order it was revealed and does not refer to events chronologically. It does not seek to tell a story, even a sacred one. Rather, it is a temporal, or at least a chronological. So it often returns to the same themes again and again. Equally, it is not a systematic exposition of philosophy, like Plato's dialogues, nor of morality or theology, like Plotinus's Aeneads, nor, finally, of cosmology and logic, like Aristotle's metaphysics and his, and his organon. Rather, it contains different kinds of wisdom scattered throughout, and the reader has to piece them together. The Quran is an operative text, not a speculative text. Reading it is meant to be transformative and informative. It has to be approached like a student begging for knowledge, not a film critic passing judgment on a pastime. Without this attitude and intention, different from when reading a normal book, the Quran does not transform, or even really inform. It merely confirms the reader's prejudices, God says in the Quran. And indeed, we have explained things in various ways in this Quran so that they may remember, but he only increases them in a version. That's Al Isra, that's 1741. As regards obstacles in the reader, these come from the difference in time, place, culture, circumstance, experience and context between the reader and the Quranic revelation. Distraction, scatteredness, lack of concentration, wandering imagination, interruption by bodily functions and needs, lack of patience, improper intentions, lack of openness, lack of humility and blindness to spiritual truths, all of which lead to an inability to contemplate the Quran and an inability to meditate upon it. Now God calls upon people to contemplate his words in the Quran and meditate upon the Quran. Now there's a whole bunch of references there which I'm going to skip over. The difference between the two is that contemplation is active it requires an having an image in the mind, whereas as meditation, it is more passive but more profound. Nevertheless, both can set off in the heart of the listener either a rainfall of startling and luminous intuitions or even a kind of internal silent flash of understanding so that he or she instantly understands dozens of things at once with their multiple connections. <clears throat> and this is remarkable. Um, witness here to a book. Very, very few other books in the in the history of the world do this when the reader uh, approaches it. God says in the Quran, Is he whose breast God has opened to Islam so that he follows a light from his Lord, like he who disbelieves? So woe to those whose hearts have been hardened against the remembrance of God. Such are in manifest error. God has revealed the most beautiful of teachings, a scripture that is consistent and draws comparisons, that causes the skins of those who fear their Lord to quiver, their skins and their hearts soften to the remembrance of God. That is God's guidance, by which he gives whomever he wishes, and whoever God leads astray, for him there is no guide. Al Zumar, chapter 39, 22 to 23. <clears throat> the demands that the Quran makes upon people, the Quran urges not only laws but also ethical principles, and they can be quite demanding. So there is bound to be something in the soul which shrinks from these. This is because the ego does not want to be told what to do or, leaves its, or leave its comfort zone, much less to have to change its ways completely. Finally, as regards obstacles in the Quranic text itself, there are providentially a number of these and they take some getting used to. They include, one, constant shifts in Arabic called iltifat, iltifat not only of subject but of narrative tone. <clears throat> 
Even the pronominal narrative voice changes. God sometimes refers to himself as he, sometimes as I, sometimes as we, and sometimes by his divine names. God clearly cannot be limited or constrained by pronouns or by a single point of view, and each of these shifts contains a secret and a meaning. Sometimes the Quran also shifts whom it is talking to. Sometimes it is the prophet, sometimes it is believers, sometimes disbelievers, sometimes everybody. Each of these shifts draws attention to something new. In so doing, it shocks the reader or the listener out of his or her mental habits in order to show them something about themselves. The Quran at first seems to contain a number of apparent obscurities, repetitions, interrupted sentences, abridgment, and ellipses. These two have certain secrets and meanings that have to be penetrated. They force people to stop and think deeply and that is perhaps part of the reason they are there. <clears throat> they are like geodes, that's G-E-O-D-E-S, the word I'm not familiar with by the way. They are rocks that look plain from the outside but once they are cracked open reveal a pattern of unexpected and beautiful crystals. Isn't that amazing? A wonderful metaphor. And finally, there are also a number of things that can seem strange and unlikely to a modern reader. Some of these we have already mentioned uh, in a previous chapter, such as the explicit descriptions of the afterlife, and some will be discussed later, such as Sharia and Jihad. Some of them seem to reflect the context of 7th century Arabia, such as descriptions of the natural desert environment, tales of ancient Arabian and biblical prophets, and even business imagery. The important thing to bear in mind is that the Quran seeks to address every possible human mentality, motif, and level of education and sophistication, not to mention every spiritually relevant subject. So it contains something that speaks to every kind of person. End quote. I think it's a beautiful uh, survey there of the obstacles to really appreciating the Quran. And I'm always constantly struck how radically different people are in their response. Uh, I constantly meet people, speakers, corner and elsewhere, who are utterly impenetrable. They cannot understand why people like the Quran. They, for them, it's it's totally of in, lacking of interest and intelligibility. <clears throat> and then I meet Muslims, and I know this for myself as well, that who... Uh, are profoundly engaged in a transformative way by their encounter with the same book. And that's one of the remarkable things about uh, the, the word that that book contains. Anyway, um, until next time.